Okay, so uh, we're just going to get started with just some brief housekeeping while we let people trickle in. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to take some time to acknowledge the traditional unceded territories that we're each joining from today. So um, I do this acknowledgement every single time, even though we're joining from um, different territories. So for today, um, I'm joining from the territory of the Quiquitlam First Nations, which lie within the shared ter territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Musqueam, Kikite, Squamish, and Stolo Nations. Um, so I'd just like to encourage everyone to take some time just to think about the territories that you're joining from today. Um, so just some brief housekeeping that um, I do normally. Um, I do want to let everyone know that um, if you have missed previous talks um, through the GCI research rounds, um, the talk, recorded talks are now available on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, so if you just go to the website, you can um, access the talks there and I'll link the website link in the chat um, later on. Um, so this is a reminder to make sure that your microphones are muted for the duration of the presentation. Um, and if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box below and I will be monitoring that and um, we'll give Julian an opportunity to answer at the end. And then another thing to note for everyone is that this session is being recorded. Um, so then, the next thing I'd like to do is just introduce our speaker for today. So Dr. Julian Lum is an associate professor with the Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology at the University of Victoria and a senior scientist at BC Cancer. Um, he is a recipient of the CIHR New Investigator Award and his work is funded through the BC Cancer Foundation, CIHR US Department of Defense and Genome BC. Um, Dr. Lum spent five years training at the University of Pennsylvania and in 2008, he returned to Canada and joined the Dealey Research Center at BC Cancer. His current research interest focuses on the relationship between metabolism and impacts on immune response in ovarian cancer. So thanks, Julian, for coming today, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I, I'm glad because I was able to put on my big boy t-shirt and my big boy letter. Um, having, you know, being at home these days with the current situation. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so I want to start off with the most important slide of my talk today because it really takes a, you know, a, a big effort from multiple people. This is really a team of, of scientists, trainees, and staff that, that really make all of this happen. So um, in my own laboratory, I've listed some people here. I will highlight um, throughout my talk and hopefully be able to point out some of the key people whose data I'm going to show you. Uh, some of the alumni from my laboratory, a huge thanks to our bioinformatics team, particularly Finn Hamilton, who really um, has spearheaded a lot of new ideas and ways to look at the data. Um, our metabolomics team, uh, through my collaborations with um, my colleagues at UT Southwestern, um, in, in um, Michigan at the Van Andel Institute, and here uh, at UVic, <clears throat> um, huge, huge thanks to our clinical team because without them, uh, you know, a lot of this work is just simply is not possible. And that includes the efforts of our biospecimen team, uh, Peter Watson and the Tumor Tissue Repository, along with his very competent and um, you know, excellent staff. Um, the BC Cancer Immunotherapy Program, uh, members listed here, and multiple collaborators whom I'm sure, um, you know, for space, space considerations, I don't have enough to, to note everyone. And a huge thanks to our uh, participants, the patients that, that take part in some of the studies that we have ongoing. And, and studies that we plan to do in the future. And as uh, Stephanie mentioned, here are some of the uh, agencies who I've been fortunate enough to be funded uh, to do some of this work. Okay, so um, <clears throat> much of what I'm gonna talk to you about today is really uh, unpublished data. And um, I'm gonna try to keep it at a very high level um, in part because I know we have a very wide uh, group of people in the audience, um, but I'm happy to ask, answer, pardon me, any, you know, granular details about the science. But, but we're going to try and keep it at a, 
relatively high level. So I think what we've learned in the past five to seven years uh, through clinical trials and, and other important um, preclinical studies is that solid cancers and in particular ovarian cancer really is an immunotherapy firewall. And, and by that, what I mean is that um, the approaches and therapeutic strategies that we have applied to this disease have really not been effective. They haven't really had a clinical signal, nor have they shown any improvement in the overall survival of patients. So really efficacy is a big issue. And this spans a number of different approaches. Immune modulators, for example, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, therapeutic vaccines, uh, more recently in the cellular-based arena, the CAR therapies or chimeric antigen receptor therapies, and also adopted T cells. So we don't know why this is the case, but this firewall that is present is really hampering our ability to make inroads with these types of therapies. So what does metabolism have to do with the immune system and, and in particular ovarian cancer? Well, as some of you heard in, previous, uh, in a previous talk from Dr. Gilks, that um, ovarian cancers harbor various mutations, right? That we can now identify through molecular means. And some of them are listed here across the different histotypes of this disease. And one of the things that I think we sometimes forget is that many of these mutations that are drivers of this disease and of the various histotypes, their main role is to drive the uptake of nutrients, essentially the fuels that allow tumor cells to grow and proliferate. So in this cartoon here, I've highlighted some of them, right? So MYC is just responsible for uh, expressing transporters that allow you to take up nutrients from the extracellular environment. P53 is involved in uh, various aspects of uh, carbon metabolism. Uh, and the list uh, goes on. Receptor tyrosine kinase is the RBB2 pathway, the PI3 kinase, P10 pathway. These are all involved in regulating these aspects of of metabolism. And, and you probably wanted to forget all of this from your first year biochemistry courses. But in fact, I think the more we learn, the more we are understanding that this aspect of cell biology is such an integral component of the behavior of not only the cancer cells, but also um, the immune cells that we're trying to enhance to, to, and to exploit to fight cancer. So one of the things we have to remember as well is that the T cells that are in the tumors that are trying to fight the cancer coexist. They exist together in the same ecosystem as the tumor, right? And so you can imagine that it's this sort of seesaw. Who can, who can be more adept and able to capture the resources that are limited and present in the environment in order to support their function. And, and by and large, um, based on preclinical data and the science that we know now, cancer cells, because of these mutations, allow them to have an advantage over the T cells to do this. And it shouldn't be a surprise to those in the audience that just like tumors, T cells require key metabolites to support their function and their, their proliferation. Amino acids as a simple class of metabolites, for example, methionine, I'm gonna talk a lot about that in today's talk, tryptophan, arginine, fatty acids, and hexose sugars, glucose, for example, are all important metabolites. So uh, several years ago now, um, uh, you know, members of our Vancouver team and their collaborators uh, did a study that was uh, validated in a larger cohort of patients from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And, you know, this study was quite, quite a breakthrough because it allowed us now to break down um, specific 
uh, molecular subtypes of ovarian cancer. And they're listed here in these four different colors. And so this has allowed us now to really home in on how to approach these specific subtypes in terms of therapeutic possibilities and strategies. And one of the things that my group is interested in because of our uh, interest in metabolism is that we looked um, deeper into some of the genes that yep. are associated with these different uh, subtypes. And what we found is that the immune reactive subtype, and these are the so-called hot tumors, the tumors that have an abundance of infiltrating lymphocytes, they tend to be the metabolically inactive tumors, okay? Whereas the proliferative subtype, right, the, the tumors that have a, a, a high proliferative gene signature, they tend to be the cold tumors, i.e. tumors that, that don't have a lot of infiltration of lymphocytes in them. And, and if, you know, you, if you take a step back, you know, that, that does make sense in the context that of, of this sort of seesaw battle that I mentioned to you about. You know, if the tumors are more apt at being metabolically active and taking up nutrients, then the T cells that come into that tumor will be at a disadvantage in that regard, okay? We've been very interested in how one kind of metabolic phenotype, hypoxia or low oxygen, changes the behavior of the immune system within those tumors. And I'm going to give you the punchline. And what we found is that tumors that are hypoxic and tumors that have gene signatures of hypoxia, they tend to exclude the lymphocytes, meaning they tend to be the cold tumors. Okay, and let me just show you some data uh, to support that claim. So this is work from a former postdoc in my lab, Lindsay Dvorkin. She now is a scientist at, at Abcelera in Vancouver. Um, this is a, a tumor tissue that uh, was harvested from patients. It's a cohort of over 400 um, uh, cases. And we've stained it for markers of hypoxia, CA9 in red, CD8 as a marker of lymphocytes, and then in green, CD34 is a marker of vascular cells or endothelial cells denoting the vasculature. And so what we found when we did this experiment is, is two major phenotypes that I've illustrated first in the top. So these are the tumors that you can see. There are a lot of blue dots here. That means they're heavily infiltrated with, with T cells. And they don't have a lot of red, which means they're not very hypoxic. Okay, and you get, of course, varying degrees of this. So there are tumors that have some extent of hypoxia or a degree of hypoxia, but they still, by and large, have uh, infiltration of T cells. Now, the second pattern that was uncovered in this analysis is the following. You have tumors that are, are quite hypoxic, the two bottom here, you can see all the red, uh, and they have very little, if no, uh, lymphocytes at all in them. Okay, and so um, we wanted to do this validation experiment in real time. And so um, with my colleague, Anna Tinker, we uh, launched an, an imaging study uh, uh, and we wanted to look in, pa at, in patients whether or not we could uh, actually identify tumors that were hypoxic. So this is an imaging study where patients were uh, administered a, a radioactive um, uh, uh, substance called 18FEF5. And you can see on the left here, this is a PET image and then the corresponding CT image from that same individual, okay? And what you can see that I've highlighted in red in circles here is, is the tumor that was um, identified through the CT scan. And when you look at the corresponding PET EF5, this mark, this, the lighting up of this marker indicates that that tumor is hypoxic, okay? And what you can clearly see is that there, there is uh, a uptake of this compound in the tumor. So, so these tumors are hypoxic. And similarly, in the second patient, here's another tumor that is uh, circled in red, and that tumor as well is uh, is positive for this marker EF5. Whereas in this 
in this bottom patient here, we don't see any indication of the uptake of this if die indicating that hypoxia is not present in that tumor. And when we look at the tumors of those patients, again, using markers of hypoxia and CD8, and I apologize that the, I wasn't able to false color this uh, image, um, but basically uh, what this image shows you is that tumors that are hypoxic, i.e. CA9 positive, have fewer brown dots, i.e. CD8 positive T cells in them compared to tumors that were not hypoxic. And I know it doesn't show up very well, but I hope you can believe me when I say that there are more brown dots in, in this tumor than there are in these two. And so when you do the survival analysis, it became quite clear to us, um, disease specific and overall survival, that um, patients who had tumors that were low in hypoxia had more and had more CD8 positive T cells they universally did better than those that had high hypoxia and uh, CDA positive T cells. You can see here in red. And in fact, there was very little difference between those in the red group and patients that had virtually no T cells at all, okay? So, you know, this made me think a lot about what is that exactly going on in these tumors? And, and can we isolate the specific factors that are driving this metabolic response uh, and, and how can we overcome this? So here's, here's my um, metaphor for the day, which is you probably don't know what this uh, species is unless you're like me, kind of a fishing nut. But the iconic Pacific salmon, which is this, uh, species here is the food source for our south southern resident orcas, right? And as we know, this food source is becoming limited um, for a variety of different reasons. But there's also another predator that likes to eat salmon, which is um, these seals. And so we need to understand now um, what are the food sources that are limiting. We need to understand how can we uh, improve the food source or if we're the killer whale and we want to have an advantage over that, how can we, how can we um, train this killer whale to be um, more able or better adept to um, catching prey and, uh, and obtaining their food source? So the way that I think about this problem now is that there's, a, there's actually a metabolic firewall in ovarian cancer. And that metabolic firewall really limits the effectiveness of immune-based therapies in this disease. And so that raised some very important questions. And the question, one of the first questions we asked was, what are the identities of these immune regulatory metabolites? And exactly how do they alter the, the immune response? And secondly, secondarily, can we exploit these metabolites, the metabolic pathways to train or in, in more um, contemporary, in a more contemporary fashion, engineer designer CAR T cells that actually can overcome this metabolic firewall, okay? So those are the two um, main questions that we, we, we started off with. And I'm gonna tell you um, one story. Uh, this is really the exceptional work by many people in my lab, but led by Marissa Kilgore, who's a graduate student, uh, Sarah McPherson, who, who was a former student in my lab and stayed on. Uh, as a research associate and my, my research associate, Elaine Liu. And really just a fantastic team effort. Um, the paper uh, has now been accepted uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to share that with all of you. But I am gonna share just a couple of snip, snippets of data with you. So I'm gonna cut to the chase again and tell you the punchline and show you some data that supports what we found. 
And what we did find was that this metabolite called methylnicotinamide functions as a tumor promoting and immunosuppressive metabolite. So it has dual roles. It helps the tumor, but at the same time, it suppresses the immune, the immune system. And this is the way that we think that it happens, that the tumor cells or the fibroblast express the enzymes that convert this metabolite nicotinamide into MNA. That MNA is secreted by these cells and is taken up by surrounding lymphocytes in the tumor. And MNA then through uh, promoter induction drives the expression of TNF alpha. That TNF alpha is secreted into the cell and it feedbacks to the tumor cell to promote its growth and proliferation. On the other hand, MNA, while it's doing this, it suppresses the function, inhibits the function of T cells by blocking the T cells ability to pr uh, produce this um, a cytotoxic molecule interferon gamma. So we did a, a metabolomics profiling. So for those who are not familiar, this is uh, analogous to genomics, uh, although we're looking at metabolites and not looking at the, the DNA or the RNA. And this, this map here that's all color coded basically shows you um, the abundance of any given metabolite on this x-axis across different cell types in the tumor. So we, in particular, looked at um, cells, tumor cells, and then two subtypes of, of lymphocytes, the CD4 positive T cells and the CD8 positive T cells. Okay. And so here's one methyl um, adenine here. And just to show you uh, where MNA is found in the metabolic cycles, it, it sits right here where conversion of nicotinamide um, produces this compound MNA. And I'm, I'm going to refer back to this diagram several times during the talk because we found some very interesting things that are uh, related to MNA. Okay. So this graph here just shows you that in the different populations of cells, the tumor cells, in, uh, CD45 negative tumor cells, and the two different subclasses of lymphocytes, CD4s and CD8s, that in different compartments of patient samples, the ascites compartment and the tumor, the tumor uh, has a really high abundance of this particular metabolite, okay? And in particular, if the T cells that are found in the tumors also express very high levels of that metabolite, okay? And just to show you that if we treat T cells in culture in vitro with increasing doses going in this direction of MNA, and we look at the production of TNF alpha, you can see that TNF alpha production increases as a function of the dose of MNA that the T cells are given. Okay? I'm not going to show you the data, it's in our paper, but we went on to show that MNA actually directly regulates transcription factors that um, uh, turn on the expression of TNF alpha. So high levels of MNA promote this tumor promoting factor TNF alpha. On the other hand, MNA suppresses T cell function. Okay, here's the cytolytic molecule that T cells make. If you increase the dose, again, going in this direction of MNA that you use to treat T cells in culture, there is a reduction in interferon gamma, predominantly in the CD4 population, but not so much in the CD8s. And now if you do a functional assay where you take a CAR T cell that uh, targets the folate receptor alpha, a protein expressed on uh, ovarian cancers, and you co-culture the T cells that have been treated with either MNA or a control adenosine, you can see that there's a reduction in the ability of the specific CAR to kill the targets. And this is a, a non-specific CAR that we used in this assay, GFP. Okay, so they don't, they don't kill the, the tumors as we, as we would expect. So with that in mind, we began to explore 
within this MNA pathway, are there additional metabolites that either are directly upstream and contributing to MNA production itself in the tumor, or if there are metabolites that independently of MNA, despite being in the same pathway, can have effects on tumors. And we focused on two metabolites specifically. One is the amino acid methionine, because methionine, as you can see here, this is called the methionine cycle. Methionine is essential to produce this metabolite called SAM. Okay, so in the absence of methionine, there's the reduction in the ability to produce SAM. The second metabolite is glucose, okay? And we know that glycogen is a storage form of glucose. And when you break down glycogen, you can feed that into the glycolytic pathway. And so the next series of data I'm gonna show you, it's published, so I'm not gonna go through the details of that, but what I am gonna highlight, and at least in the first slide I'm going to show you next, we didn't do this in ovarian cancer, but uh, we did look at it in other uh, diseases. So again, to the punchline, tumors we found use glycolysis and the ability to break down glycogen into glucose as a mechanism of radio resistance, okay? So on the y-axis here, this is an analysis we did that uncovered essentially glycogen, okay? And these are three different tumor cell lines. And we gave each of those three cell lines increasing doses of radiation. And we looked at the glycogen response at day one, two, and three for all of these three cell lines. And what you can clearly see here is that not both a dose dependent and a kinetic response in terms of the, the accumulation of glycogen in cells that were radiated. And in one case, there was no response to the radiation at all. But when you looked at the cells that survived this radiation, it was those cells that increase their glycogen levels here, H460 and MCF7, that were more radio resistant. This is a log scale now, more radio resistant than those cells that did not show this glycogen response. And what's very interesting is that if you treat cells that have this response with the anti diabetic drug metformin, okay. So it prevents the cell from, from uh, uh, metabolizing the glucose. If you, if, you, if you treat the cells with that, okay, so here is no metformin, right? And the radiation doses and days, just like we saw over here. And here are the cells that were treated with metformin and you see there's a complete blunting of the glycogen levels, okay? And we went on to show in the paper that this resulted in a reduction in the ability of metformin-treated cells to survive that dose of radiation. Um, earlier, I guess it was last year, uh, there was a, a seminal paper, uh, really a breakthrough in my mind, um, from, the, from the lab of Jason Locasali at Duke. And Jason's lab um, did a very interesting experiment and I'm gonna show that experiment to you here. So he took mice that you can experimentally grow tumors, and I won't go through the details of that. So, so you can grow tumors in, in mice. And if you stratify these mice into two treatment arms, one arm where they reduced the dietary intake of methionine, which they called methionine restriction. Another arm where they did that dietary restriction, and they gave radiation to the tumor, this is the result that they found. When you just give the diet alone, okay, there's really no difference in the time the tumors, you know, grow or the relative tumor volume. However, when you restrict methionine and you gave radiation, you can see that 
the radiated groups here had much more sensitivity to radiation and it took longer for those tumors to grow, okay? Now, um, I won't go through all of their data, of course, for time reasons, but they went on to do, do a very small human study, only six participants in this study, where they lowered the methionine in those individuals' diet to about 83% of their daily intake. And they did this for three weeks. So really, this is a, a feasibility study. And what they found is that not only could you reduce plasma levels of methionine within this time frame and at this level of restriction, but it was very well tolerated. Okay. So this really opens up the opportunity to think about, and I'm going to talk to you more about this uh, later on in my talk, it really opens up the op opportunity to consider dietary and nutritional interventions as a combination to standard of care, such as radiation. And I hope I will convince you that um, the combination with methionine restriction and immunotherapy might also be uh, a possibility. So again, um, back to this diagram here. And again, I'm gonna just go to the punchline. I'm gonna tell you what we found in the lab is that methionine, not only from Jason Locasali's work in, in, in the tumor cells, but from our preliminary data, methionine is also a key regulator of T cell function. Okay, and let me show you what I mean by that. One of the important things to remember is that this molecule that is made from methionine SAM is a universal methyl donor. And th those methyl donors are used for important um, histone and epigenetic modifications, DNA methylation and histone methylation. So it's this pool of methyl groups that comes from methionine and SAM that is used to uh, for methylation reactions. And just as a, a very sort of high level uh, cartoon, uh, histones that methylate um, portions of the genome in red here, those portions and areas of the genome tend to be silenced, i.e. they're transcriptionally inactive, in contrast to regions of uh, the genome that are not methylated, they, they are generally, not always, but generally transcription, transcriptionally active regions. Um, there are two marks I just want to highlight on so that we can understand the data I'm going to show you in a moment. And it's the HDK27 trimethylation mark, which is generally considered a repressive histone mark and allows for gene expression. And uh, histone H3K4 trimethylation, which is generally considered a permissive mark, which um, allows for uh, gene expression. So the next series of work is I'm going to show you is from a, a very talented graduate student in my lab, Tian Zhao. And um, he decided that he wanted to manipulate methionine levels in T cells and ask the question, how does that affect their function? And I've already given you the punchline. And the way that he did that is that he, he restricted methionine in, uh, in T cell cultures, or he treated with a drug called um, these two different drugs that block this critical enzyme, MATU-A, from converting methionine into SAM, right? And SAM is then used as the you know, universal methyl donor. And one thing I'm gonna point out is that there are differences between these two drugs. Um, and we purposely chose them because uh, this drug here, PF, has a much uh, lower affinity and activity for this matu -A enzyme compared to this AGI drug, okay? And so I'm just gonna show you some of that data now. So what Tian did was he treated T cells with increasing concentrations of these two agents, and he looked at the level of H3K4 trimethylation marks globally, okay? Not at specific loci. And he basically found that the, the drug that has higher affinity and activity, this AGI compound, was able to reduce the global histone marks on K4 trimethylation. 
Um, he did see a reduction as well when he restricted methionine, although that was not as demonstrable as the change when you treated with the MAT2A inhib inhibitor. And as I told you, um, this drug has uh, effects on T cell function. Okay, these are flow cytometry plots just showing the, on a cell, cell by cell basis, that when you treat with the MAT2A inhibitor, AGI, you increase the amount of interferon gamma secretion in T cells. And that's just enumerated here uh, in this graph. Okay, you can see at 12 hours, the increase in interferon gamma quite substantially. And also, uh, there is an increase in interferon gamma when you restrict T cells of methionine. Okay. All right. So what do we know so far then um, in terms of the changes in metabolism on the cancer cells as well as the immune system? Well, we know that the ovarian cancer ecosystem dictates the immune state. I showed that data uh, with the hypoxia and the exclusion of TIL. We also know that methionine can suppress radiosensitivity and directly suppress the effector responses of T cells. So to move to the second question, how are we going to improve immunotherapies based on this knowledge? Okay. And so, of course, many of us know this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to um, two uh, wonderful scientists who really um, discovered and uh, helped us understand the inner machinery of genome editing uh, mediated by CRISPR-Cas9. And what's very interesting now is that we are now in an era where it is now possible to genetically modify your genome in any cell type and correct problems or introduce genes that might enhance a particular function. For example, regenerative functions of a cell. In our case, we would take T cells from a cancer patient, we would genetically edit their genomes and modify them, we would engineer them to uh, be able to target cancer cells with a car, and we would expand those cells and infuse them back into a patient, okay? And this is a, a therapy that is now uh, being, being tested uh, in Canada. CAR T cells, okay? But, but the point I'm trying to make is that with the knowledge that we've gained about the metabolism of, of T cells, we want to exploit this technology to try to make T cells better when they encounter the tumor. So we have a CAR T cells, and what we do, what we want to do is we want to arm that CAR cell so that they become uh, nutrient armed. But the real question is, well, what are we going to arm that CAR T cell with? There are um, many possibilities. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and tell you about our efforts in this space. Um, my laboratory has been studying for you know, a decade now, this process called autophagy. Now autophagy is very important for the survival of T cells and their function. And just in a very general schematic terms, this process occurs inside the cell where it allows a cell to degrade macromolecules and other constituents, okay, in these structures. And what happens is at the end of that process, those macromolecules are recycled back into the cell as a source of fuel, a source of biosynthetic materials. And so it's almost like a way to reach into your refrigerator without having to go to the supermarket to buy something. So it's an internal way for the cell to be able to maintain the resources in times of need. Okay, And we found that this particular process is important for T cell survival and function. And let me just show you the experiment that, that we did to do this. So this is an experiment where we took uh, T cells that are deficient in this gene. So this gene ATG5 is 
critical to turn on this autophagy pathway. And if you delete this gene, you can't do this autophagy. So we took T cells, we deleted the gene, and then we um, treated animals that had tumors with these T cells that were deficient in ATG5. And you can see that those animals were unable to continue to grow their tumors. And in fact, what was very interesting to us is that these T cells have higher levels of interferon gamma production, the molecule that's responsible to, um, to kill the tumor cells. Okay, so you can see in red the animals that are that their T cells that are deficient in this gene have more interferon gamma production. What was even more striking to us was when we looked at the metabolites that were present in those autophagy deficient T cells, we found two things. One is we found a reduction in SAM, and that's shown here. And we also found a reduction in methionine, although this was not, did not reach statistical st significance. So just like the experiments that Tian showed you where he reduced or restricted methionine or he, or he treated cells with this MAT2 inhibitor, he saw a reduction in SAM and he saw a, uh, an enhanced response of the immune system through this molecule interferon gamma. Um, Tian went on um, to look at some data that we had and lo and behold, we do see reduction, global reduction in trimethylation of this histone mark K27. And when we looked more globally at the genes that were marked by these histones, so again, K4 is, a, is generally considered an activating marks. And we looked at the pathways that were highly abundant in those marks or enriched in those marks. We found that genes involved in T cell activation, adaptive immune response, et cetera. These were all genes that were involved in promoting or enhancing the T cell response. So the loss of autophagy helps those T cells. So how are we going to exploit that information? And this has really been um, the sole effort of a very talented graduate student in my lab, uh, Jillian Car Carlton. And we devised a new technology and a new way to do uh, modifications of T cells. So I'm just gonna go through this in this schematic here. So we have a car that targets the human alpha folate receptor. And this is the molecule here. We don't have to worry about too much about the, the details. And what we've devised is a strategy where we introduce this molecule into the coding region, okay, of the ATG gene, okay, using this CRISPR approach. And what you end up with now is a modified ATG5. But while you do this modification by introducing this, this car into the ATG gene, you essentially create in one step, a, a, a T cell that expresses the car, and now a T cell that no longer is able to express the ATG5 gene. Okay, so it's a well, what we like to call a all-in-one approach. Okay, so we've uh, done some proof of concept experiments. <laughs> this is um, an experiment where uh, you can see the expression of the car in primary human CD8 lymphocytes, um, where we've directed that car into that ATG locus. Okay, so you can see very high levels of expression of the car. And when we take that car and ask whether or not it can kill ovarian cancer cells that express this antigen, alpha folate, we can see that the edited car has higher cytolytic activity against ovarian cancer cells than the non-edited car. Okay, so the car that has, has a car but is wild type or normal for ATG5. Okay, so this tells us that deleting ATG5 in the context of this alpha folate car enhances that car's ability to um, kill ovarian cancer cells. Now this is of course done in a, in a test tube 
and we have ongoing experiments right now in preclinical studies to really show that, um, that, that this is true in, in a model system. Okay, so let me summarize what I've told you so far. Ovarian cancers present very unique metabolic challenges in the tumor microenvironment because of the mutations that are, that are found in this disease and those mutations that are regulating the metabolic features of that, of, of that cancer. T cell immunity is regulated by immunosuppressive metabolites. I told you a couple of them today. SAM, MNA, uh, methionine. And we think it's now possible to modulate T cell metabolism because that could represent a really new strategy, a different way to think about how do we get those cells, uh, you know, to be armed and be able to compete in this really hostile nutrient environment. And we have ideas and targets that we want to further explore. And I showed you one of them uh, just in the slide before that, before this. Um, and I think this finally opens up some really interesting opportunities for us as a group um, to think about nutrient and metabolic interventions for cancer immunotherapy. Uh, we have some ex exciting data that we're working on right now, looking at how ketogenic diets impact T cells. I've showed you already some preclinical data showing that methionine restriction might be also important. We have a study that we're just about to start um, after Christmas, because I don't know if anybody wants to be doing intermittent fasting while eating turkey and uh, having a Christmas feast. So uh, in the new year, we're, we're going to launch uh, an intermittent fasting study. And again, we're going to look at these parameters in the context of um, you know, patients, patients who are, who are being um, treated at, at our cancer center. Okay, before I end, there might be some people here that might be interested in, um, my group uh, have come together with uh, various stakeholders across the province, and we've formed uh, the Metabolomics Consortium of BC. And I just wanted to give a quick plug on this. I have just a few slides. So these are the institutional um, partners in this consortium. And uh, these are the people from those different institutions that uh, currently form our board. Um, so myself, uh, David Goodlett, David Shibley, uh, members of UBC and, and uh, BC Cancer, and, and members of UVic, as well as BC Children's. And we have a vision of, for this consortium. And the scientific vision is we want to begin to deeply understand and explore nutritional and metabolic interventions that can enhance the therapeutic efficacy of immune-based cancer treatments, okay? And using metabolomics, not genomics, so I, I apologize for the uh, genomic aficionados in the audience, but using metabolomics actually to understand how, how does our nutrition, what we eat on a daily basis, affect our, our immune system and our ability to enhance the immune systems to treat cancer? What about our lifestyle? What about the environmental uh, uh, um, factors? What about aging and longevity, just, just as a normal uh, human process? Uh, environmental, again, uh, um, factors. How can we use this information for diagnostics? And of course, you know, from our perspective, one of our, our target focuses is how do we enhance our, our therapeutics using dietary, metabolic, and nutritional interventions? Um, from a research standpoint, we are really excited to create this network because we want to support really people who are interested in metabolomic science through, throughout the province. But eventually we'd like to be able to offer this um, you know, internationally and nationally. And I won't go through all of these details, but the one thing I wanna highlight is we wanna provide access to our, 
our core facilities and our network of instrumentation. We want to collaborate with you. Uh, we want it to be an open network for people who want to join, who are interested in metabolomics, but maybe not necessarily um, an area of expertise for them. Um, and really it's designed so that we can help investigators at the earliest stages of their, their project, whether it be a translational project and you're looking at samples from patients, whether it's a, a preclinical project, discovery-based, we want to help you. And we want to ensure that your goals are aligned with the way that, you know, you're going to be doing the experiments. We want to help with SOP-driven guidance on how do, you, how do you actually get the samples in a proper way to interrogate um, metabolism. We have ways to um, help you do data analysis, uh, curation, and again, we have now a, a very nice team of people who are, who are uh, working on uh, developing new analytic tools to, to actually look at that data in ways that we couldn't before. Um, so, you know, I, I think I'll just stop at this slide here um, just to let you know that, you know, we do have some things that we want to do in the near future and in the, in the distant future. But I, I want to invite those who, who are interested in metabolism as a science to uh, reach out to us if you're looking for help. Uh, we do have uh, instrumentation, uh, really cutting edge instrumentation that we'd like to be able to offer uh, you know, those expertise to researchers uh, to be able to start digging deeper into this exciting new problem. So I'm going to stop there. I want to thank everybody. I tried to um, keep the science, you know, uh, a bit on the light side, um, but give you some of the more larger picture things that we're trying to achieve as a group here. And, you know, I'm uh, very excited working with um, this group, the, the, C, uh, the GCI group, because uh, we already have uh, a study lined up where we'll be using this platform to understand uh, how patients respond to radiation and immunotherapy. So thanks again, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Um, thanks so much, uh, Julian. That was a great presentation and um, such a really interesting um, network that you're trying to create. Um, so we'll open up the floor to questions. If anyone has questions, feel free to unmute and um, ask away. Hi, uh, uh, Julian. First of all, thank you for uh, the wonderful review of metabolomics and sharing your work. Um, we had a journal club yesterday um, in my group and um, the students presented a paper um, on uh, the polyamine um, pathway and suggesting that um, when you add extra methionine to a system, a lot of it can get shunted into that pathway as opposed to going down to cysteine. And it kind of um, shook my understanding of uh, these kind of pathways, which I learned in a much more linear fashion. So I'm wondering between that and what we've seen from in vivo flux experiments and how they're kind of maybe reshaping our understanding of Warburg phenomenon, how much of the sort of basic biochemistry, which we, um, or met 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 metabolomic pathways, which we take for granted because we learned them a long time ago, are fundamentally flawed because of the systems in which they were studied? Yeah, thank you very much, David, for that, you know, really insightful and astute comment because, um, you know, we do most of our work in tissue culture. Uh, and I think the inherent flaw with that is that it's artificial. Um, the media that we use contains supraphysiological concentrations of many metabolites, uh, as but one example is glucose. You know, when glucose is present, it's, it, is, it dominates the central metabolism pathway, at least from what we know in cell culture right? Because the carbons can be shunted very easily because there's such a, so much of a surplus. So cells become actually less dependent. Now, nitrogen is a different story. So that's why there's a very strong interest in 
things like methionine, things like glutamine. And, you know, we have a paper that we're just about ready to put out where we took T cells and we grew them in five different kinds of media and their compositions vary tremendously. Their growth rates are different, vastly different. Um, they also have different differentiation patterns and they have different functions. And I think that's becoming very clear, um, you know, from other people in the field that work on immune metabolism that what you feed the T cell really matters. Now, what's even more clear now is that when you try to extrapolate that data, and I'll speak on, uh, in terms of T cells now, you try to extrapolate that data into what happens during a normal immune response, for example, to an infection, that's different as well because you know, glucose concentrations in, in the plasma, at least in a mouse that's well fed, you know, is one to two millimolar. Whereas in tissue culture, RPMI, DMM, you're talking 10 to 25 millimolar. And so the way they handle the glucose in vivo T cells now is very different. They actually don't rely as much as we think on glycolysis and rely on some of these ancillary pathways, such as the one that you're talking about, the polyamine, methionine, transulfuration pathways that would not necessarily been um, appreciated if we hadn't been able to look at the studies coming out from, you know, those infusion experiments. So I think what I want to say is we have to be very careful and very mindful about how we interpret tissue culture data in terms of metabolism. It, 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 as a Add on, it means that there's a lot of things to be discovered for any of the students on the, on the call because this field is not settled. Absolutely, yep. Okay, so I think we're gonna wrap up for the day. So thanks again, Julian, for that really insightful talk. Um, if folks wanna learn more about Metavo BC, um, who should they get in contact with? Yeah, uh, please reach out to me. Um, we're still a, a small nascent group, um, but we, we have a working meeting already and uh, we discuss cases and, and people's projects. So we are open for business. Um, and if you, if you want to learn more about what we can do in terms of our technologies and platforms and, and how to access them, and, or even if you just have questions, you know, such as like David said, you know, interesting metabolic questions that you would like some guidance on or feedback, uh, we'd be happy to um, provide that. Perfect. Um, so you guys can reach Julian at his email. Um, so our next session is the last one before the holidays and it will be on December 11th at the same time. And we'll be hearing from Dr. Sarah Monroe and her PhD candidate, Kate Wall. And um, they'll be discussing about um, making impact uh, policy impacts in women's health research. And again, um, if folks want to access the recordings of the previous talks, um, you can visit the website and um, take a look at them at, on, on our website. Thanks everyone for joining today. Great, thank bye you all. Bye.